Welcome to Native Yoga Toddcast. So happy you are here. My goal with this channel is to bring inspirational speakers to the mic in the field of yoga, massage, body work, and beyond. Follow us at Native Yoga and check us out at nativeyogacenter.com. All right, let's begin. Wow, I'm really excited to have Dr. Michael Shea again here in person at Native Yoga Center for today's episode of Native Yoga Toddcast, which is titled Embodiment of the Senses Through Yoga and Meditation. Michael, how are you doing today? Well, it's been a busy day because I spent the morning at the car dealership and you know, looking at their giant aquarium waiting for the tires to be rotated and for... Uh, an oil change to happen. So an entire morning at a car dealership gave me a really good opportunity to meditate on an aquarium. Nice. Did yeah. you have any profound realizations in the process of staring at the fish? <laughs> the, the, always the profound realization is how wonderful space is. You know, when I get caught up and, you know, not wanting to be where I'm at you know, at a car dealership because I got better things to do of just releasing my attention out into space. But in this case, it was the biggest aquarium I'd ever seen. Wow. And just releasing my attention to the aquarium and, nice. the, and then looking out into space. It was nice. beautiful. Yeah. Well, that's cool. You know, we have two really big announcements to share today. Uh, number one, I'm so excited to have your a copy of your brand new book called The Biodynamics of the Immune System, Balancing the Energies of the Body with the Cosmos. Whoa. <laughs> <laughs> it's a, that's a lot. You it's know, a, it's, yeah. it's a big, thick steak if you're a meat eater, <laughs> but it's also a big soy burger if you're a vegetarian. So. <laughs> and so I'm really excited to have the chance to ask you some questions about your right. most recent publication. Also, you and I have uh, created, and today on the launch of this podcast, are launching our course together called All Levels Yoga and Meditation Course. And so, you know, I had a lot of fun filming this with you, and I'm excited to uh, release it today. Um, and it's available on our platform, nativeyogaonline.com. So uh, the link for that is in the description below if anyone listening would like to check it out. Uh, Michael, from, from us filming that course, any takeaways from the experience and or what are you excited to share with the uh, people that are interested in taking that course? I think, um, you know, meditation in general and, and yoga is constantly evolving in our culture and when you study yoga and meditation, because I've been studying it now for 45 years, something like that, it, it's just realizing like it's so highly nuanced. And the next teacher says, well, have you tried this? And, and the next teacher, well, why don't you try this to refine your practice? So there's never really an end game. That's the one thing I learned. But there's a continual opening, you know, as long as you have that willingness to be open to a teacher, to a new class. And as I said, you know, earlier when we were just talking um, before we started, I just like to stay with what I, you know, is trending. What's current? What's what's really informative? And I, I have to tell you just a short story. And that is Please. that I've been studying all year with a, uh, with a Lama um, from a Tibetan medical background. But he was in Sikkim and then in Bhutan in the summer. And he was broadcasting from there. And he was at a very high level, um, it's called Vajrayana Tantric Buddhist Conference in the capital city of Bhutan, in which all the heavy hitter lamas from Tibet and that area of the world, you know, were coming together for this conference. And the one thing he said is that because of what's going on on our planet these days, the veil of secrecy of all of these different meditation practices need to be lifted. Mm. And the secrecy needs to be taken away because we are such uh, in such an important time on this planet right now with the intensity of the polarization and duality. So, you know, one of the things my book shares is, you know, not necessarily sharing secrets. I think it's crazy to say I'm sharing secrets. Um, but I understand why some of that 
knowledge, some of the mystical knowledge or the meditation knowledge or yogic knowledge in general is secret. It's just because teachers want to have you go through a progression because of your aptitude. Some students can't go to the end game. They can't, you know, go right out into space, you know, Mm. and stay grounded at the same time. Mm. So at any rate, it's, it's, it's exciting because I feel liberated in wanting to share more and more. And that book is one vehicle of sharing more um, in terms of what was formerly considered to be secret knowledge. Mm -hmm. Um, And again, that veil has been lifted. I've never been good at holding secrets anyway. Mm -hmm. Uh, Even my mother knew that. So (laughs) can, uh, is, is there a term in a book that you had given me a while back ago? Is it the the phenomenon of basic space? Is that, am I getting that right? Or the, the, the basic space, the basic space of phenomenon and a phenomenon. Can you explain that? Well, I think, um, I had to do Buddhist had to, um, my teacher, who was originally the Dalai Lama, wanted all of his students to do Buddhist scholarship. So I spent 10 years doing very intense Buddhist scholarship. Um, and now I've even lost track of the question. Um, Explaining uh, basic space and phenomenon. Yeah, see, I, I went into basic space just now. And, and, you know, <laughs> um, I'll pull you back in. If, if, you. if you drift too far over there, I'll... Right. I'll, I'll thank, re- oh, thank you. Thank I'll, you. I'll, I'll, reel you. Right. I'll reel you in. Right, right. So... Um, and what, cause I want my answer to link to, you know, this discussion of, of yoga and meditation. Yeah. And so as a, as a scholar of Tibetan Buddhist literature, there's really the two highest level people that you, you, you know, those are the, the writers you go for in Long Chempa, uh, in the Nigma tradition, um, or sometimes it's known as the Dzogchen tradition. It's also called Ati yoga. But he's considered to be like the most incredible um, lama that could give words to the ineffability of the infinite nature of our mind and so forth. You know, all those things that we hear about and that we're trying to achieve. And that's one of his books. So that was um, recommended to me and I gave you a copy. And it basically explains the view of Tibetan Buddhism. Before you get to meditation, it's helpful to understand the view and I think that's also an important thing to understand about Buddhist meditation. You don't just jump onto a cushion and, and sit in cross-legged position and so forth. But it's an understanding that there's a view here. And the view is basically that um, all phenomena is infinitely equal. And we hear that as no self, you know, that we, we don't have a solid self and so forth. And that we're all interconnected and it's described as being empty and other better other metaphors you know that are used but he explains it the best he yes. explains it the best yeah. of how yeah. you rest into the element of space and i'm talking about the element of space from a indo-tibetan point of view you know space wind fire water earth and so forth so how you rest your mind that's to see this is yoga and meditation how do you rest your mind and body into the element of space where it all began. Mm. So when you were talking about being at the Toyota the <laughs> dealership today and uh, staring at the fish tank and being able to let your mind go into space, is there a way to explain a technique that allows one to achieve that release into space? Yeah, the basic technique um, is, well, again, you know, it's relatively simple. Um, and it's one of these things that's been secret for a while. It's called looking into the uh, wisdom of the universe or looking into the center of the universe or looking into the center of space. All these are metaphors for the same thing, the infinite nature of the totality of, of life and the universe in general. So... But the technique is, is actually quite simple. And, you know, you're a yogi and, and, and as a practicing yogi, I'm, I'm kind of a wannabe yogi, but I call myself a bogey, you know, kind of a, an indulgent yogi. But the posture is always the first thing. You know, you sit, you've got to embody your senses. Mm. And that means not labeling what you're seeing, not labeling what you're hearing, not labeling what you're feeling, feeling. 
you come into a posture that allows you to sit still and just be with your senses because you have to notice if you're labeling a lot. Oh, this is that, that's that, this is, you know, and that labeling takes us into the head and out of our body and out of the experience of meditation and yoga. So then the second thing is to really just allow your breath to be non-dual. So I don't like teaching breath work anymore. I've taught it for many, many years. And once you get into inhale and exhale, you're into duality. And in, in Buddhist meditation, you're trying to undo duality. You're trying to get rid of it isn't the right word, but you're trying to relax into a non-dual state. The duality will always be there. Samsara and nirvana are inseparable, let's face it. So, but breathing like a river is flowing through you alleviates that. So I just use the matter of just mm-hmm. of the the metaphor of just being aware, simply aware of my breath. But yeah. I've been doing it so long that that kind of is automatic. And then the 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 so called technique of looking into space is when you take your eye gaze and you raise it about ten to fifteen degrees above the horizon. So right now. You and I were making eye contact horizontally, but now I've raised my gaze as I'm looking at the top of the door uh, that's in back of you. And so you sit in meditation and you immediately fix your eye gaze there and you don't let your eyes move. Mm. That's a big, that's a big key. And so by not letting your eyes move, you, you have to really then begin to stabilize your mind, but then you have to work with your vision, the left side of your vision the right side, and looking at a point in the center of space that's in between your actual eyeball and the object that's furthest away from your vision. And you just allow that to begin shaping, and you get to see how the other elements, and you get to have these visual distortions. Some people would call them hallucinations, but it is a tremendously stabilizing technique So at the car dealership this morning, I was looking at the top of the aquarium and I noticed all sorts of interesting things because when you embody your senses, visually what you get to embody are colors without labeling them. And they, they had a light shining through this aquarium and it was very psychedelic. All these different colors, rainbow colors were being projected on the wall and I went, wow, I'm kind of in a meditation chamber right here, you yeah, know, in spite yeah, of the air, yeah. air hammers going off, removing tires and so forth. So, <laughs> so it, was, it was good that way because it's all about stabilizing our mind, mm. reducing thoughts and reducing cognitions and the way we solidify reality with our thoughts and, and cognitions. Yeah, that sounds like it was really smart on their behalf to put a beautiful fish tank like oh. that in a setting where you could just kick back and right. like now I want to go and check right. my car in over there. And right, right. <laughs> yeah. That's cool, Michael. I'm really curious about, well, uh, when I first heard about you, it was about 20 years ago and I was curious about cranial sacral therapy and I started because we live here in Palm Beach Gardens, Florida and the crane and uh, the Appalachian Institute is right around the corner. And I thought, wow, what an amazing opportunity. This, you know, Institute is a few miles right. away. So maybe I'll go study. And then I remember seeing your bio and that you were teaching cranial sacral therapy somewhere here in the area, I guess 20 years ago. And I thought, Oh, that's cool. He looks like a really interesting guy. And then, um, you know, then I've had the pleasure of getting a chance to meet you, to take some trainings with you and courses. And, uh, and then you and I got introduced to this word biodynamic. And I feel like you've had this little evolution from, say, air quote, uh, cranial sacral therapy, according to Epledger, to this evolution toward uh, biodynamic cranial sacral therapy. Can you help me understand your evolution? Uh, from, say, 20 years ago to now where you are today with your perspective on the art of uh, this manual therapy? Well, I, I think all it, it's the same with yoga and meditation, manual therapy, as a, I consider it to be a contemplative art as well. So, you know, in contemplative arts, we want to be able to evolve and continue to grow and evolve. And it's the same with manual therapy. So, I think the the evolution just within to answer your question specifically, um, 
within the, the field, first of all, we have to recognize that it was the osteopathics, uh, osteopathic practitioners and doctors in the United States that started cranial work. And so craniosacral therapy, John, Dr. John Upledger, um, amazing human being, amazing mentor, uh, being in his first teacher training and getting to know him um, like I know, knew him. And because I think he died like eight or nine years ago. But it, at any rate, it's, it's a continual evolution because he was an osteopath. And so he was teaching what he learned within the osteopathic community. And it turns out that there was actually two streams uh, in the original uh, Dr. Sutherland, the founder of the method, uh, who developed it from like 1901 to the time he died in 1954. It was a continual, um, ongoing uh, development uh, of getting to deeper and deeper layers. And, and you're a massage therapist, and, and you have a, you know, quite a, a, a good practice, and you've got great hands. And I'm sure you notice as well that there's an, there's an evolution in perception. You know, the mm -hmm. more we do this work, the deeper we can perceive. Mm -hmm. it, it, it's, yeah. it's, it's that simple. Yeah. And then what, what happens is we try to seek out the palpation skills that somebody might know that would match the perception I'm having because my teacher has never told me about this perception. So at any rate, the biodynamic work is just what Sutherland discovered at the end of his life is that there was something much slower moving in the body that, that had a self-correcting potency or power to it. And so it's been given a lot of names. And in, in my book, I'm calling it primary respiration because the osteopath I studied with, Dr. Jim Jealous, uh, who's the founder of biodynamic osteopathy, that's what he called it. He called it primary respiration, which is um, a slow movement in the body. And it's balanced with what he called the dynamic stillness, which is slowness and, and, and basically slowness and stillness. So you have the slowness um, of the tide of primary respiration, and then you have the stillness. And that's where you orient your perception constantly because all other rates and movements within the cranial model, they're all happening simultaneously. Yeah. So any, any type of manual therapy is a training in perception. So my training is how do you get people to slow down? And boy, wouldn't yoga and meditation be a great way to slow down? Mm -hmm. Of course. So, yeah. So that has to be a part of what I do when I'm training, uh, you know, the cranial people that I work with is yeah. slowing down your state of mind and working with your perception um, at, a, at a deeper level. What is the alternative to primary respiration? Is there a term that's, that's like secondary respiration? Is there an alternate to primary respiration? Well, um, primary respiration, the, the metaphors and synonyms for it are the tide. So you hear that from the earlier osteopaths, um, or the long tide. Um, and there's the, that's based in, in this teaching within the field itself of the rates. There are different rates that you perceive. So it, originally in the Uplerger work, I learned about the cranial rhythmic impulse. It's a very fast rate, eight to 10 cycles per minute, It's very fast. And so trying to, to train your perception to that, because that takes you into a certain part of the autonomic nervous system for healing in the body. Franklin Sills then discovered a slower rate that he called mid tide. And then the biodynamic osteopaths, um, they found an even slower rate. They called it primary respiration, which is six cycles per 10 minutes. And that's about a 50-second cycle uh, or 50-second phase. Mm. You know, and yeah. it's usually yeah. biphasic. Interesting. Thank you. Yeah. In part one of your book, uh, you wrote, Describe Current State of Ill Health and Natural Healing Antidotes. Can you explain that to me? <laughs> wow. Um, be great to, to read parts of the book to you, but, um, you know, <clears throat> prior to the COVID thing, uh, in the last three years of, of the hell realm that many people have been involved in, um, for many different reasons, but prior to that, um, the volcano of ill health had already erupted. It had already erupted 10 years ago, 15 years ago. And the volcano of ill health is a term that a, a medical, a cardiologist that I, I like a lot um, mentioned at a speech that he gave, uh, again, 
pre-COVID, but the volcano of ill health, and I mentioned that at the beginning, and it's it's because the physiology of our body um, has become very unstable because the metabolism of our body has become very, very compromised and unstable. So it's called metabolic syndrome. And so that volcano of ill health in my book, in the first part, describes the metabolism of the human body, and and it has to do primarily with food because that's the primary instinct that drives human behavior is the instinct of self-preservation. You've got to get food in to feed the mitochondria of every single cell in your body. That is the prime directive. If you have a living body, that is your prime directive, no matter what species you are, And that involves feeling when you're hungry, feeling when you need to eliminate all the things that metabolism does and multiply that times maybe 100,000 because of all the ways in which food has to break down into tiny molecules and all these different processes. So the book tries to describe that in a very simple way because as you and I are manual therapists and that's part of what we need to know now. We need to know that it's, Todd, it's it, it's painful to even say this, but um, as of a year ago, 93% of Americans have an unhealthy metabolic heart, 93%. In 2018, research at the University of North Carolina said that 88% of Americans in total were metabolically unhealthy. That's unbelievable that we are that unhealthy. So this book is trying to explain what does that mean, but what's the fix? You and I are manual therapists, so we we better know some of what it means. You know, how does the body function anatomically, physiologically, and now metabolically? But what's the fix? You know, how do we fix that? And in my particular case, it's because when I got out of the military service, I was morbidly obese. I was metabolic. I didn't know it at the time. I just knew that I was 100 pounds overweight and I was eating way too much sugar. And so consequently, I've had this lifetime adventure with metabolic syndrome. And it's only in the last 10 or 15 years that it's now an identifiable um, syndrome, but it's a cluster of well over 100 different problems. Cancer, type 2 diabetes, uh, obesity, which is the scourge of our country and the world right now, the the unbelievable number of people that are obese. Um, dementia is, is now called type three diabetes Mm -hmm. because of the, the type of food that people are eating that's creating, um, co-creating these problems with dementia and so forth. So many, many big problems that people are having are, are, they're all metabolic problems. The other day when I saw you, you would recognize that there was some sugar in, in, in a beverage and you just poured it out. And I was impressed because are, are you at this point now where if you know there's some sugar in something that you just make a, an alternate choice for something else that you don't even waste the time just consuming it anyway? No, I don't. I don't waste my time. And, and um, the, the, the main issue, if you look at the literature, and it's discussed in my book, and, and I'm, I'm going to way oversimplify it because there's obviously other factors, but the main issues are ultra-processed food. Um, America, um, 70 to 80 percent of what Americans eat are ultra-processed, and it's, it's cardboard. It's, it's, it's corporate food. It's, it's made up in a laboratory. It has nothing to do with real food. And the other, the other big one, though, is added sugar. So I'm always careful. I don't mind sugar that's naturally occurring. You know me. I love my mangoes. And, and everybody says, well, there's sugar in that. Yeah, but there's sugar in that. And it's chelated with <laughs> minerals and vitamins. <laughs> and it's it goes in the way it's naturally supposed to go in. It's like, yes. give me a break. Yeah. I don't. We had a house guest yesterday, just to make a point. Uh, a lovely 92-year-old woman. Um, and we just love being with her. And she asked for a cup of coffee. And I have a little Nespresso machine for people that want a cup of coffee, like myself, periodically. And I gave her a cup of coffee. And we happened to have some cream. And, and then I just left it there. And like she didn't touch it. And then five minutes later, she said, well, do you have any sugar? And mm-hmm. my wife and I mm-hmm. looked at her and said, no, we don't have sugar in the house. And she was aghast that we don't have sugar in the house. So, yeah. 
Sugar is the big problem, added sugar. It's a chemical, um, it's a dose-dependent chemical toxin, and it creates addiction. It goes right to the same addiction centers that cocaine and heroin go to in the brain. It's unbelievable. So big, big problem. So I wouldn't eat any food with added sugar, and but I also believe in measured indulgence. I'm not going to deny myself a really fabulous piece of tiramisu because I love tiramisu because I go to Italy every now and then. Yes. But I'm not going to have it every day. Yeah. I might have it yeah. once a week. Yeah. And then I let my body take care of the sugar and, and not put more sugar on top of it, you yeah. know, for yeah. another couple of days or so. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. In part two, the intention is describe the fluid body. What is the importance or, okay, I'm going in as a manual therapist or say maybe you can think of a way that this could even correlate to I'm going to go on my yoga mat. What is identifying the fluid body mean? How do I come in contact with that? Um, Depending on the research you look at, but the Max Planck Institute in, in Germany and they said this 10 years ago, they actually said that 92% of the human body is fluid, is water, as opposed to what we see in the textbook, 60, 70%. 92%. 92%. I've recently heard um, estimates up to 98% water. As an embryologist, I know that in, in the study of embryology, that the embryo is about 99% water. So human beings come in and we are a water being, we're a water creature. That's so the fluid body is just a metaphor for number one, an entrance point into body metabolism. We've, we've got to have another way in other than the muscles, <laughs> other than the bones. Th- those are perfectly valid entry points for affecting physiology and for bridging to metabolism, but there are direct entry points. So if I put my hands on the body and I visualize the body as being a fluid aquarium, or that I visualize it as the color blue, like the, the ocean that you and I have right across the street from us here, Todd. It's, just, it's that blue, dark blue. So you can visualize it as dark blue, and then you also come into that relationship with your own body and feel the fluid nature of your body mm-hmm. and, the, and the way in which sensation comes into the body and your fluid body dissipates it. You can feel waves, you can feel streaming. So it's a different experience of the body that's already there. It, and we just have trained ourselves away from it, mm. way away from mm. this fluid nature of our body. Interesting, you feel like we've been we've geared ourselves more toward just the skeletal element, the, the dense, the the earth element, and we've we've stopped observing the the water element. Can you give an example of how that might change either level of depth of touch and or your intended technique to utilize with a treatment if you are observing water with it more more around water than say muscle bone? Well, the, I, I, well, this, we're kind of into a. Uh, a teaching seminar now, you know, okay. yeah. which is fine. <laughs> you know, this is fine because I'm no, not sure the audience, everybody in the audience, you know, is a Good manual point. therapist. Good point. Um, but it doesn't make any difference. You can meditate on your body. You, as manual therapists, we have to be able to feel our own body first. See, that's the biggest mistake. I think you know, all of us were trained on just what are we perceiving with our hands that's coming from the client's body. That's only half the equation because it starts with our own body because of the way in which our nervous system synchronize and our cardiovascular system synchronize. So that's part of the equation biodynamically is we got to feel our own body and we've got to feel our own fluid body. How do I sit still, but how do I then begin noticing if my heart is beating that it's creating a ripple or a wave in my body? If I'm breathing, mm. how do I feel the wave-like motion nice. of the breath coming in and out? Yeah. So it's feeling... Um, wave-like motion, flow motion, a sense of buoyancy. What feels like it's floating or lifting? What part of your body feels like it's being lifted and floating? That's natural buoyancy. Gravity takes the earth element down, okay? 
the the fluid. Now we're going to switch metaphors. The f, uh, the element of water, the water element from the Sino Tibetan tradition. It, now we can associate that with the fluid body, but what that does is it lifts. It creates buoyancy. So within a yoga and meditation practice, you want to come into a balance of the earth, what's taking you down, because we need that. You've got to be grounded. But also, what's lifting us up to heaven? And it turns out that it's the fluid body that's lifting us towards heaven or, or whatever metaphor you want to use for that. Cool. Yeah. That's cool. Great answer. Oh, thank you. I, I th- good, good way to turn it from a teaching seminar to a, a down-to-earth. Uh. <laughs> Embodied sensory yes. experience. Yes. And getting into a sense of our body that is grounded, you know, in, in, a, in, a, deeper, in a deeper way, a nice. deeper reality that's pre-existing. It's already there. Yes. You're... You wrote the third intention is describe biodynamic spiritual healing. Well, that came out of the last three years. Okay. As I said um, a couple of minutes ago, you know, I do a lot of consultations. I never stopped working from the beginning of COVID in the lockdown. It started with phone calls and then, and then zooming and, and all of that. And it became obvious that what was happening is an intensification of duality, an intensification of polarity because of the, the excessive uh, states of rage and anger. I experienced um, multiple states of rage in that first year. I was so freaking mad at the government and this and that. And, but I just kept you know working my meditation process and, and working my spiritual process going, wow, that's a lot of rage. What's all that about? And staying with my practice and also staying with the teachers that I follow, I began to realize it's like, wait a minute, I've got a choice here. And the choice is a spiritual choice. I can buy into the intensity of the anger and rage that's being promoted in the media and, and still is. Um, if any Anytime you follow any social media, it's always there. That the intensity of the polarization and, and the whole binary thing that's being constructed and the whole, we see duality and, and the whole samsaric domain just being manifested all the time. It's a great gift that, that social media has given us. But on the other hand, there's the gift of the preciousness of human life and that we have a spiritual practice. And so for me, it was doubling down in my spiritual practice. I said, wait a minute, I'm tired of the rage. And I got into AFib, so and so my heart didn't like the rage. Your heart doesn't like anger. It was like, well, wait a minute, this is not heart healthy. I was one of those metabolically unhealthy hearts. So it's like, let's just double down on my spiritual practice. I'm done. Turn off the TV, reduce all of it to a minimum, stay in touch with what is necessary for my family and my community and my students and me personally, where my own growth and development was going. Mm. So COVID to me has given us the gift of spiritual, uh, a spiritual opening Mm -hmm. to really double down on our spiritual practice, whatever that is. Yoga and meditation is, is the metaphor you and I are using right now. But, you know, for me early in my career, underlining textbooks was a spiritual practice. I loved underlining. It was my spiritual practice. So whatever your spiritual practice is. Yes. Yes. Great answer. Um, Are you... Is it, if I have to have a, if I could have a prompt, <laughs> so if I'm not, uh, if I'm struggling with defining uh, my spiritual healing, because I feel like here mentioning describe biodynamic spiritual healing, what, what is that? Is there a prompt you could give me to help me to be able to? conceptualize my spiritual healing is that is that what you're encouraging people to do here is to to do what you've done to double down on focusing on contemplative practices and i mean it sounds to me like you're saying that that is a critical piece for our healing um I guess when, when I see the word like describe biodynamic spiritual healing, I guess where I'm 
not sure I'm clear on is what biodynamic spiritual healing is. Does the word biodynamic in front of it imply what we've already spoken of in relation to the fluid body and, and, um, and awareness of the water body? Oh, well, embodiment of the senses, mm. embodiment of the elements, you know, so yeah. wind, space, fire, earth, water, embodiment of, of the colors, um, without elaboration, without cognition, and without labeling. So biodynamic, you know, in this context is referring to that level of embodiment. Got it. Um, the Let me explain it this way. Um, so what I just described in terms of my first year, you know, yep. 2019 or 20, whenever that yep. was, it's like the first yep. year of anger and rage. Well, that was a process of what's called spiritual formation. Mm. So... There's a, nothing wrong with anger. We're humans. I'm a human. You know, I'm not, uh, yes, I had rage and I worked through it. I didn't harm other people, but I started to harm myself because I got a fib. So we're humans. Anger is natural, you know, but we have to be resilient and we have to, you know, get back to as quickly as possible that the calm state. But what happened was from there, from the spiritual formation, I went into a level of spiritual maturity where I actually saw it would be more wise. I had the insight, you know, it would be smarter if you didn't even allow your mind to get into a rage state. If you just did more of your spiritual practice, which for me is Buddhist meditation and, and so forth. Um, it's It could be yes. something different for yes. other people. Yeah. So the spiritual maturation is, is, a, is a really important point. That's your discipline. That's your effort you're putting into your practice. Now I um, see. Yeah. And, and it grows because from there you get insight into, oh, this is valuable. Not just because I took a webinar or a Zoom and, and learned how to meditate, but, oh, I can actually feel more embodiment. I can feel a calmer state of mind. Or I didn't react when my wife just did the usual thing that really sets me off. It's like, hmm, when you're spiritually mature, you can, you're can you more empathetic. You're more empathetic to what's happening in the world, and you see the level of suffering that's generating the anger of rage. But the third stage is called uh, spiritual authority. Now, a lot of my friends don't like the word spiritual authority because it has a masculine edge to it, but it's, it means that you and I and everyone listening to this has the capacity to have a direct experience of the sacred, whatever that means for you, a direct experience of the sacred, um, the transubstantiation of bread and wine into the body and blood of Jesus Christ, the, the, the ability to have communication from the Holy Spirit, the ability to enter into um, non-referential awareness and, and communicate um, as a Buddha uh, and so forth. So these are direct experiences. And guess what? I, I began having that. It was just like, well, this is kind of ordinary. As long as I reduce emotions, reduce the cognitions, yes. and really stabilize, I can have a more direct experience with the sacred, you know? And that level of contact, when I had began having that experience, Todd, it's just like, I'm done. I don't need any of this other stuff. I, I don't need to get into the center of culture and, and, and buy into any of all that. Yes. You know, I understand yes. it. Yes. It's suffering. Um, and also, that's people's spiritual maturation. I don't see it as impure anymore. I see it as people's, the way in which they're going through their spiritual formation and, and into their spiritual maturity. Thank you. I appreciate elaborating a little further on that. I feel like I have that a little clear now. Yeah, yeah that's, that's, and that's pretty well elaborated in that section of the book because I, I have a number of voices that I, I wanted in the book. I wanted a Christian voice. I wanted a Buddhist voice. I wanted other voices. Yeah, that's smart. Yeah. On part four, describe the stillness. Is describing the stillness antithesis to the stillness? Of course, because it, it makes it dualistic, but, <laughs> yeah. but you got to have a starting point, you know, and, uh, 
<laughs> this was actually uh, one of the more fun parts of the book, you know, because in the first part I had to read all this science on, on metabolism and, and the words are 10 and 12 and 15 syllables and they throw other characters <laughs> in it. So here's the, here's the situation. Back to the fluid body uh, in the book, there's a discussion of the embryo and how you access the embryo because that's just an, another metaphor. How you access your originality. Because in healing work, what we do in, in manual therapy, at least wise from the osteopathic tradition and the shamanic traditions that I've been exposed to, you, you really want to have a, a sense that you're creating a space for people to access the way they were uh, at the origin of their body, and that's the embryo or at conception, mm -hmm. and that's called original wholeness. So that's why embryology is so important is because we were originally whole. We were a single-celled human being in an in, in, in incredibly pristine wholeness. And then, man, trillions of cells later, and we're into a very differentiated wholeness and a very complicated wholeness because of genetics and, and so forth. And, and it's difficult to knit the body together when that wholeness is, is fractured metabolically or physiologically. However... The anthropological literature, because I, I was, I had to study medical anthropology in my doctoral work, especially around shamanism, like the early medical systems. What were the or original medical systems? In those original medical systems, and they're, they're still out there today, because even in in Tibetan medicine, in classical Chinese medicine, in Ayurvedic, you'll still encounter it. And that is, if regressing back to your embryo, regressing in the present moment, not going back to that moment, but but accessing the origin forces as they were at that moment that are present now. If that doesn't work, what do you do? Plan B is actually then you have to go back to the origin of the cosmos. So in this section of the book, I've spent the last seven or eight years researching that one section. How does healing happen? How do you create a healing ritual, and even with your hands, based on cosmology? So I want to reference the meditation we did at the very beginning. When you look your eyes up and you're looking at the center of the universe in terms of working with your vision that way, that's what I mean. That generates an orientation to cosmology, to the, to the universe as it is now and potentially as it was at the beginning. And then when you get to the beginning... And then there's, you know, there's different competing theories. Even within the, the Tibetan Buddhist approach, there's two or three cosmological stories of origin. Because you, you try to get away from the non-dualistic, you know, the Big Bang. And you try to get into what are called spontaneous origin. And so a spontaneous originality where it just, boom, the universe, boom, popped into existence. Mm. That has to be a possibility with, within any cosmology. Wow. I could go on. Please but, do. But please do. <laughs> well, well, what's another, the, what is one of the other cosmogenies? Well, I, what I do now is, um, and in the book, um, I speak to it, in, in the, in the, especially in the section five. So I, I really try to integrate three cosmologies. So the cosmology, uh, the Tibetan Buddhist cosmology, and it's really getting down to the five elements and the five colors as they were at the beginning of the universe. So that's why you want to get into wind, water, space, fire, and so forth. Got it. Is that's the way they were at the beginning. So if we could orient our perceptual processes to the five elements and orient our, our perceptual process to the five colors, as it's said in Tibetan Buddhism, those five colors were the very first appearance of enlightened mind. From the five colors, then you have the five elements, all right? So there, there is a staging that way. It's all very clever, and it's all very dualistic, but nonetheless, it, it gives you something to hang on to because it takes you into a non-dualistic space. Mm. In the Taoist cosmology, the Taoist cosmology is a little bit different, and but I love it. It's more of a sense of embodiment around the umbilicus because in Taoist cosmology, it's the origin of the universe happens as a result of what's coming in through your umbilicus. And so acupuncture points all around the umbilicus are named after stars in the universe because 
In Taoist cosmology, you try to create a harmony between the universe, your body, and the earth. Okay, so heaven, yes. earth, and man, it's called. So the, the hands-on techniques that I'm promoting, because I always will add in a, a Taoist hand position in order to create harmony, and it means that the fulcrum of our work needs to be around the abdomen and the umbilicus at that, at that level of understanding. Wow. So that's the second, and I'm really oversimplifying all this, because I know I some of you listening to yeah. this are really know much more about acupuncture than I do and Taoism in general. But there is a third cosmology, and the third cosmology is our cosmology, um, the book of Genesis. And what I've studied, and I've been mentored, um, and she, she actually died a year ago on Christmas Eve, um, but I've been mentored since the mid-'70s by a Kabbalist, a, a woman who is an expert in the Kabbalah, and that's the mystical part of, of the Jewish tradition having to do with the tree of life in the book of Genesis. In Sutherland's cosmology, because that's the way the cranial model started, he talked about the breath of life. That's Genesis. So the model of cranial work is already imbued with a cosmology, a Christian cosmology, and I wanted to know that. So the breath of life is associated with light, not the breath. And the second thing is, if there's two trees, remember the tree of, of good and evil, um, but we have the tree of life. And when you study the tree of life, that takes you into Jewish mysticism. And what I want to just share, you know, quickly um, and not get too elaborated on is the tree of life is your vascular tree. So the hands-on healing that I do is to see that the whole vascular tree, including the heart, is the tree of life and that it's one whole that's connected to the universe. And so the orientation in the book, then in the fifth chapter or the fifth section, is to then create a perceptual process and a hands-on process that you can actually touch the universe. And the fluid body, yeah, but boy, you can feel a pulse and you can feel the vascular tree. Yes. Great way of explaining or bringing more meaning to either our yoga, our hands-on modalities, or our meditation practice to think of the vascular system yep. as, you know, the, the beat of the universal right. vascular system. Nice. It Amazing. Fits, it fits very well because the research on empathy is very clear. And I mean, the gateway that I offer, you know, to myself first and then to my students, um, is you got to feel your heartbeat. Because when you feel your heartbeat without having to take a pulse, it actually generates empathy. It generates emotional empathy. Research is really clear on this. So I spend a lot of my waking day, and when I wake up in the middle of the night, you know, and feeling my heartbeat, then I continue to really listen to my heartbeat, feel my heartbeat. And then what I do is, as I tell my students, I like to recite a, a poem or a prayer that I've memorized. And I do that non-verbally in the cadence of my heartbeat mm. to increase um, emotional empathy. And it's really helped with, with a lot of clients. I can really feel emotionally much more deeply what's going on. Do you recommend just stilling the body and trying to feel the heartbeat through bringing your attention to the heart? Or are you recommending people to place like light touch at the ar an artery somewhere where they can feel the pulse through, through uh, their own touch of their own artery. Generally in meditation practice, you'll feel your heart beat sooner or later. Um, of, of course, when I'm in a classroom, I'm, I'm teaching manual therapy. Uh, about 25% of the students cannot sit there and feel their heartbeat. And so you feel your carotid artery or, or take your pulse at your radial artery. And then I tell those folks, look, you get up in the middle of the night, you go pee, you come back, you lay down in bed, Notice your heartbeat because everything else is quiet and hopefully your mind is quiet and you can feel your heartbeat then. Let that be the place, that it, the fulcrum for you build an awareness during your waking day uh, for your heartbeat. And you use the personal mantra that you have and or prayer and or affirmation at the rhythm of your pulse. That's a great idea. Right. So that's your drum beat. That's the drum beat. And yeah, you're just exactly. going to now 
get your get some sort of like internal mantra chant going to that drum beat of your heart. Right. Ooh, that's great. I haven't heard that one yet. Oh, it's it is great because I <laughs> I, I, I learned a really cool mantra for Tibetan medicine this year and and uh, and I, and I, so that's the one I've been using lately is that that particular mantra and it it and it fits, you know, all of us listening have either memorized a poem or a prayer or a phrase or something that we say to ourselves, but, and you can do that. Um, and whether it's a mantra or, or whatever, it's perfect. Right now, when I just thought I'd try to do it while, while you're explaining that, uh, it felt like my heart rate slowed down immediately. Maybe I was just. Your heart rate will automatically self adjust when you're doing this, when you have attention on it. And the challenge is that you, we have 93% of Americans that have an unhealthy heart. And so this is actually safe. You can do it this way. Um, mm -hmm. And I've had her many heart patients. Uh, and you also have to be cautious. So the, what I will say to people is you're listening to your heartbeat, but if you go into tachycardia, if your heartbeat increases, you've got to stop it and do something else mm. because this isn't the right time or the place to be putting conscious attention on your heartbeat. Even though you're not doing anything, you're mm. not manipulating it with your breath, well. just placing simple attention on your heart. Um, do you mean for some people that'll actually elevate the heart rate and yep. speed it up because yep. the awareness has been brought to it and almost creates this sort of nervousness because there's a, uh, there's a, it's like a, because we're metabolically unhealthy and physiologically and metabolically, um, that comes together in the heart with a combination of nerves that are very susceptible to thought processes. Um, and those thought processes can be, you know, very triggering. So, wow. That's nice. why I don't do, I don't teach breath work anymore because too many people were getting triggered in the class. And all I was teaching was coherent breathing, six seconds, inhale, six seconds, exhale. And I'm looking at 20 or 25% of people are raising their hands saying, cause that's what I say, raise your hand. And then with your hand raised, get up and walk out and get out of the room and start walking around in order to, to lower your heart rate. Yeah. It's powerful. It is very, very powerful. And these are skills and techniques that, that we can use and we need to use. But let's say, for instance, going back to the beginning, the, okay, the heart rate meditation, that's one meditation. But I can tell you now, the eye gaze, I haven't heard anybody complain about that, that, that lifting the eyes and looking at the center of the universe, as long as you don't dissociate. So that's why I said at the beginning, you've got to get grounded in the gravity and the earth element of your body. If you just kind of sit down and willy nilly dissociate, then that can be way triggering as well. You've got mm -hmm. to stay grounded in the earth element of your body in order to see the wisdom of the universe, which is inside of you. And it's actually inside your heart. Sometimes it seems like Michael, like I, I know how amazing pranayama practice is, breathing practice. I really appreciate what you just mentioned as uh, pay attention to my heartbeat and I, and use a mantra. Um, and, and then, so I had someone today ask me like, you know, how come I read one place that, you know, someone died from practicing pranayama and, you know, you get, maybe you get a few situations where people, you know, have some sort of negative uh, reaction to these practices, which then for me begs the question, if we're too careful about embarking on utilizing these practices, then maybe we might not even use them at all. So is the outcome of using the practices, even if there are a few situations where it's uh, people aren't able to handle it, that the overall outcome could be more positive than if we didn't. Does that make sense? Well, yeah, it makes perfect sense because that... Uh, that's been, you know, looked at a lot, you know, so how do we mitigate, you know, these, these reactions and the side effects from yogic practices? How, what, what actually feels really good and yeah. works really well. Yeah. Right. It's <laughs> like, oh my God. Yeah. It's like, how did that happen? Well, yeah. we know how it happened now, but, but it, it, it means that it's, it's kind of solidified in the body. And then how do you undo that? And that, that gets into the field of what's called trauma informed care. Yeah. And 
we're assuming that in some way, you know, there's been a trauma. We don't have to know what it, the, what it is. But what we have to do is we have to let people know. And I, I mean, that's called a trigger alert. And if we're going to teach an esoteric practice, you have to say, and this is what I do with my students, and that's why I always start with heartbeat. The moment you feel your heartbeat get up, you have to get up and leave the room and start walking and just walk it off until you're calm again. So you have to give people the okay and the green light yep. to take care yep. of themselves. Yep. And you and I both know that a lot of people are going to gut it out and they're going to try to push through it. And we've all done that and we've all snapped a ligament or two. And, <laughs> <laughs> so, and I know from you know taking the, the <laughs> yoga training here, you and Tamara and the other teachers are constantly saying, back off, back off. Don't, go, you know, don't go to barrier all the time. Don't, and don't go beyond the barrier. Easier said than done. But metabolically, you have to recognize when your heart rate is up, uh, when you start, you know, getting nauseated or you get a headache, that's, that's a metabolic reaction. Um, or when you feel lightheaded, um, those type of thing. And you've got to get up and leave the practice and be willing to yeah. take care of yourself. Yeah, I think that's a really great point, Michael, building into our communities that it's okay to express that, hey, I'm having a hard time and building the space for making it easy for people to actually take care of right. themselves because I, I, yeah, sometimes you almost feel like if I get up, it's going to distract everybody. I'm nervous. What if I cause a stink? What if I, you know, and that yeah. all that even creates more trauma. So making it where it's very clear, like if this isn't working for you, but I like that you said actually get up and consciously walk out. Yep. That seems like that's a really good thing because they'd be just sitting in a group of our peers might actually stimulate more anxiety just from that word, knowing that they might judge us or, you know, that type of thing. So to get up, get out, walk, right. That's a really good suggestion. People don't trust their body, you know, and we're, you know, we're trying to teach yoga and meditation and that implies that we're trying to teach people to trust their body and, and to embody their senses. And if your senses are saying, wow, my heart is elevated, that's not healthy. And let me explore that. Let me get out of here. And the way you explore is you go back to the element of space. You have to make space. You have to get up and get out of the environment you're in. Or if you want to stay in that environment, you have to have the skill of making space and decompressing and getting into a resilient state. But it's all about the element of space and that that sense of originality. One thing I really appreciate about this opportunity, Michael, to sit here with you is, um, you know, uh, when when I started this podcast, you were kind enough to come on really early on when I was just starting. And that gave me an incredible amount of. Uh, feeling like I could do it. You know, I was nervous about asking people to come on and, and I really respect what you do. And I, so it, it really helped me to feel like, okay, maybe I could do this. And you've come back, this is your fourth time. And, but it's been a, it is such a pleasure to watch your maturation mm. process. And, mm. and uh, I'm just so thankful for this opportunity. And I, feel like you've become, you know, sometimes when you have a teacher and then you, you know, you want to bow down to them and put them on a pedestal. And over the years, you've been so gracious and uh, keeping our friendship, a friendship yeah. and not something that is elevated and odd like that. And so I'm just really thankful for this and, and just want to express my gratitude to you for just everything that you've shared with me over the years and with us listening and uh, your willingness to do that. This book is amazing. I, I, I have to admit, I just, I, I just wonder how you do it. I really <laughs> like, I just wonder how you do it. Honestly, I've always had the dream of producing some sort of written material and I would probably be really happy with like a 10 page book, but <laughs> this one is like, <laughs> let me just check in like 421. Let's see it's, a it it's, it's a tome. It's a tome. It's a big thick book. And it just amazes me. I'm like, how do you do that? How do you do it? How do you get focused enough to sit down and research for so many years? And obviously you're very interested in this subject. Right. If you weren't interested in the subject, you would have given up 35 years ago. Uh, but is there any advice you can offer any of us fledgling creators who are like, <laughs> 
wanting to speak our voice, wanting to share our story and, um, to, to be able to get to this point where I can hold this book in my hands. I'm just curious. Can you give me any advice? Well, a lot of that is, is <laughs> luck and, and without, you know, <laughs> so it's just luck. I just got to keep rolling the dice every day. Just wake up and roll them. I just <laughs> at a, at a very practical level, because you know, this is my seventh book that I've published and at a very practical level. My first two or three books were all written longhand. I mean, written longhand. And then like the first one was typed up by my wife but now there's dictation software. And what I do is, you know, if I'm lecturing and I go, ooh, and I write something on the board, I use the flip charts uh, uh, when I teach. Yeah. I take photographs of them. I get home and I use my smartphone uh, and I either use Siri or mm, Gmail yeah. and I dictate an essay because they, and it usually picks up the dictation software now is really good. Yes. And I just send myself an email with a new essay. I, and these goofy Apple watches now, I can sit at the beach and, you know, cause I love meditating down there and I'll have an idea and I can send myself an email and I have dictated at yes. least two chapters in that book into my watch at the beach. Nice. Okay. And then it's an email. I cut and paste it into a word doc and I edit from there, but it. it's the editing process. I don't, every chapter in that book has been probably 15 to 20 go throughs. Over and over, over and, and you, over. And are you doing that or is someone else doing it for you? Or I'm combo? doing it. And then yeah. I was assigned three different editors. This is a big time publisher. And I had three editors go through it. So this publisher is well, the, the publisher is inner traditions, but yeah. the imprint is uh, called sacred planet books. And it's right. an imprint within that publisher from my former publisher. Um, wow. Man, I just got to give you some kudos because it's just what a, what a, it's got to feel good to, to follow through and finish a project like this. <laughs> yeah. And it's, there's, there's, a, there's a tedious part to you it. You gave it's me a like, look there. What was that this look? Thing off of my, you know, just like, you know, cause then my wife will start complaining. Yeah, no, okay, we yeah. don't have time together, which is valid yeah. and inaccurate yeah. because yeah. all of a sudden I'll say, look, I need three hours because the publisher just said this chapter needs to, <laughs> and it was like, oh my God, three hours. And that was date night. So, you know, so there's, you know. When, when, when she's going off to the restroom, you got your, your Apple watch by your mouth. You're like, <laughs> <laughs> get another sentence or two in there. When exactly. She comes back, you like pull the watch under the table. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. I do that. I mean, I'll, I'll, if I have an idea, I'll just put it onto the watch and send myself a note. So. All right. Well, that's a good tidbit of advice. I appreciate that. Uh, well, what a joy, Michael. Thank, thank you. you so much. Great pleasure. Always a great pleasure. Well, thank you. Yeah. This has really just been a treat. So, yeah. um, I can't wait till next time. Yeah. And, and we've got our meditation course coming out. So our meditation course is out. Yeah. It's out now. Right. Yep. So all of these links, uh, remember to check out Michael, uh, your website is michaelshayteaching.com. Uh, Shayheart. Shayheart. Sorry. That was Shayheart.com. Shayheart.com. Yeah. There's going to be a link to find the book. Do, would you like them, if anyone wants to purchase it, to go to where's the best way for them to go about purchasing it? Well, they can the get book. it directly from Inner Traditions, or okay. they, can, they can, which is they're, they're sending it out now. It's not going to be released through Amazon until late January. You can pre order it on Amazon and get it in the mail if you like Jeff Bezos's you know, business model. All right, fair enough. And our course is available at nativeyogaonline.com. That link is here too. Great. Awesome, Michael. Well, let's do it again. Let's do it again, Todd. All right, thank, thank you. you. Native Yoga Toddcast is produced by myself. The theme music is dreamed up by Bryce Allen. If you like this show, let me know. If there's room for improvement, I want to hear that too. We are curious to know what you think and what you want more of, what I can improve. And if you have ideas for future guests or topics, Please send us your thoughts to info at Native Yoga Center. You can find us at nativeyogacenter.com. And hey, if you did like this episode, share it with your friends, rate it and review, and join us next time. <laughs>